Automakers are introducing new technology in their factories to make work safer, faster, and more productive. On this week's show, learn how today's factory workers are at the forefront of a new industrial revolution. Underwriting for the production of Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. You know, today's cars are just bristling with all kinds of new technology. But you know what? There's a lot of technology going into manufacturing those cars. And we're going to be talking about some of that technology. And I've got to tell you, some of it's pretty exciting. I've got a special guest today who really knows this stuff. Dan Greishaber is the Global Director of Manufacturing Integration at General Motors. And great to have you on the show. Good to be here. Thank you. Joining us today, too, are Jeff Gilbert from WWJ News Radio 950 and James Amond, the senior editor at Ward's Auto. And great having the both of you guys here, too. Great to be here, John. Thanks. Dan, let's talk about advanced manufacturing. I keep hearing this term, uh, Industry 4.0. Is that uh, a term that you guys bandy about in General Motors, or how do you uh, approach this whole uh, new fangled way of manufacturing cars? Yeah, we do. Um, and you'll hear it referred to as Industry 4.0 or Manufacturing 4.0, specific to the manufacturing space. We in General Motors call it smart manufacturing. And the reason we differentiate between those two different descriptions is the manufacturing or Industry 4.0 tends to be very academic in its description um, and tends to be very, very, very data focused. Smart manufacturing, on the other hand, is really a bigger, broader umbrella of integration of technology within the existing business. And what we find is sometimes, maybe very often, um, advancing the technology isn't the best way to solve a problem um, and rather um, just work on improving the business process understanding what you have, and then surgically applying technology where it makes sense to integrate the pieces of the business together. Again, it's, for us, it's not about the technology. It's about solving business problems. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a situation where this technology, any kind of manufacturing technology, is so expensive? You've got to make sure when you make that kind of big investment in the technology, it's something you're going to use for a long enough period of time that you get your return on that investment as opposed to something you buy it and find out it doesn't work? It, it, it can be, but it's as much about the people. We're still in a people business. In the end, our most flexible technology is still our people. So where we're applying technology, largely it's about making our people more productive. Um, and so, we'll, so we don't find that um, we need to go in and we need to tear up our factories and start over. Literally, we can't afford to do that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, and because we have, we have a lot of investment already that's there, but it's really just not, frankly, about the investment. It's really about our people and how quickly can we adapt to the changes in the technology. To your point, um, it is still quite fluid. Uh, the, the world is changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe, you know, I had the opportunity to, to actually take a tour of, of, uh, of uh, uh, your Delta Township facility outside of Lansing, Michigan. And, and you know, you're talking about people and talking about uh, advanced manufacturing. You have these collaborative robots in there. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you're using those to sort of, you know, uh, accelerate productivity and raise quality. Okay. Well, a collaborative robot, uh, different than a, a robot that we'd have in a, in a body shop welding uh, body panels together, which have been around for 30 plus years as uh, going back to the late 70s, uh, early 80s, when they really started to change fundamentally the body manufacturing mm -hmm. business. The collaborative robot um, is a robot that you can work with. Uh, as as, a, as a, a worker on the floor, it doesn't have to be isolated from people. 
It doesn't uh, typically our robots the, that we have more traditionally in our plants are fenced off um, because human beings interacting with the robots, the robot will continue to move whether there's a person in the way or not. Um, and so it could be inherently dangerous. With a collaborative robot, the robot will, is, is wired with sensors and is able to sense that you're there. And if the robot were to bump into you, the robot would stop. So think of this more like a robot assistant to a person as opposed to a robot that's replacing a person. Mm -hmm. So that opens up a whole different uh, aspect of the business where we can bring automation to help people do their job as parts get heavier, as vehicles get more complicated, there could actually be a robot there assisting an operator as opposed to replacing the work that they're doing. Mm. And how does this change the way you hire and train people? Mm. That's, a, that's a really good point because um, as, uh, as we're introducing this technology, and this would be true whether it's with collaborative robots or cobots or virtually any of the other technologies, we're really shifting the resources from the work that they were doing that's now being augmented by the automation or the technology to being able to support and sustain and maintain that technology. So we have separate training programs within our company that are retraining our workforce to be able to maintain and keep those systems operating. Um, as we transition from one job to another. So it's really not about elimination of jobs. It's about driving productivity and enhancing first time quality and then repurposing our people um, to be able to transition to a different types of roles uh, as opposed to what they might have more traditionally. Because done. automation at the end of the day is automation right. and it's gonna take that job off the floor but you've got programs to replace that or to, uh, to programs to put that person in to say, uh, maintain that collaborative robot. And again, I would say it depends upon the automation, mm -hmm. whether the automation is targeted to directly replace a person or whether the automation is, is an assistant to the person to increase the productivity of what that person can do. Um, it's a combination of both things. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, a, a real good example that we're, we're in the middle of executing now around drone technology. Um, where we, um, we're inside of our plants, that we have an industrial drone actually flies in a little wire cage. It's a ball. And that's to keep people protected from it's, the spinning blades? It's to keep people protected and it's to prevent somebody like me who's mm -hmm. driving the thing and I would probably be running it into things, right, from destroying the drone. Um, so the drone is, can actually, is collision, um, um, Tolerant. Um, tolerant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but what we're using these for is to send a drone up to do inspection at height in our plants. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to put an operator on a lift with a fall harness into an inherently dangerous uh, situation and job assignment. Where unfortunately we still do have falls from heights and it's, it's one of the areas where people still get injured in our facilities. So the best way to keep our people safe is to take them out of jobs that they can be unsafe performing. So in this case, we'd send a drone up, the drone would do the inspection and would digitally tag an area that needed a person to go back up and do a maintenance mm -hmm. uh, task. Um, and then we would only send up a person specifically to the area where the work needed to be done as opposed to sending, sending them up to sort of hunt and peck and look for opportunities to be able to do work. So there's an example where the maintenance team member is not being eliminated. It's the technology is changing the way that they'll work, creating a more safer environment for them to operate in and enabling them to be a lot more productive so we can do more maintenance um, in our facilities with the same workforce that we have today. I love the example too, where you guys showed this drone flying inside of a giant, I think it's a sand mixing machine sand at your can vessel. casting plant. Right. And otherwise, there would have to be a worker crawling inside that machine to do the inspection. And, uh, but you, you wouldn't catch me crawling inside you there. You wouldn't want to catch me crawling in there either, right? So. <laughs>
it's got to be a massive time saver as well, because trying to inspect all the, the pipes and conduit at the top of, uh, the, in the ceiling of a factory, it's got to take forever to do that. See, this is where it gets to the productivity piece, because literally we can do work that wasn't being done before. You couldn't physically inspect manually 100%. Right? Now with the technology and the speed at which it can operate, um, and the safety at which it can operate, you could actually do a much broader coverage from an inspection standpoint to drive uh, more identification of activities in areas that need to be maintained, which will then help sustain the operation and keep the operation running so we don't get a surprise um, some morning when we show up in the plant um, that we have a, a, a leak or a electrical failure or uh, a roof leak that's leaking on an electrical conduit that then creates a safety risk in the plant. Because they, these, these assembly plants are a lot like battleships, right? I mean, you start working on one end and you have to maintain it all the way through the end. It, yeah. It's a constant maintenance uh, Assembly procedure. plant, maybe four million square feet. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of physical inspection to be doing, right? It's all under roof. Yeah, you mentioned the drones were a great, great way to improve safety. Are there some other examples of some technologies that, that take an auto plant that years ago was an inherently dangerous environment, today much less so, but even moves it and makes it safer in the future? Yeah, so a very common injury that we have in, um, in our vehicle assembly plants is due to strains and sprains. Um, and we have many operators that are working overhead um, in an underbody secure area, for example. And literally, with a drill motor uh, standing overhead and just driving fasteners all day long, every day, over and over and over again. Um, and, I, I, and I always say, I would be tired just holding the drill motor over my head all mm -hmm. day long, let alone actually performing the task that they're performing. These are not easy jobs for people to perform. So there is um, what, what I refer to as wearable robots that we're deploying, um, an example of which is an exoskeleton. It actually, you actually strap it on your body. It has a main a spine that runs down uh, uh, parallel to your spine in your body. And it distributes then the load of working overhead with some supports under your arms as a, a little bit of support that would help you keep your arms up so you're not just feeling all the load on your shoulders and in through your joints. Um, and give you just that little bit of additional support to help you perform that task so it's not physically as fatiguing, uh, which is what leads to repetition-based strains and sprains, which take people off the job, which uh, impact our people first and foremost, but also impact the ability of our, our plants to be able to perform their jobs. We have people then doing work that they're not fully trained and fully, uh, fully experienced doing, which is not good for the product that we're delivering either. So this is one of these things that's really good for our people and really good for our business too. Dan, when you talk about things like uh, drones, exoskeletons, cobots, how widespread is this? I mean, is, is this just sort of experimental stuff or you know, how widespread is it? Yeah, so, um, so drones, um, we're, we're in the process of deploying to all of our plants now. Um, would that be globally? That would be globally. Uh, so we have teams in South America and in Korea are also looking at, um, at how to deploy these in their, in, in their regions. Today, um, we have um, dedicated crews that are doing this work as we're building the standardized work structure around how do we execute this. But our plan would be that this would just become another tool for our, our, our workers on the floor to use, just like uh, they put on a pair of safety glasses when they go on the plant floor. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of effectively protective equipment that's helping them do their job and keeping them safe. And we're working towards that happening. That's not, that's not today or tomorrow, but we're working towards that happening. Um, um, so that's, that's sort of on the drone side. On the exoskeleton side, uh, we'll be making an announcement soon on a much broader um, um, rollout and distribution of those across many, of many, many of our plants. I would think your workers would love those exos. Um, the, um, what, what's the early feedback the, on that? The, uh, the initial people that we've given all of this technology to uh, don't want to give it back. Mm -hmm. 
So the exoskeleton requires a fitting process. It's like putting on a good suit, right? A, a good suit feels better than, than an off-the-rack suit. So you need to physically, each individual needs to be fitted for, uh, for those, that, that exoskeleton to have it operate at optimal performance. We're going through that fitting and tuning process now across the series of different plants with some dedicated operators that'll, that, that'll run through the end of this year and then we'll go into a full deployment. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a, another piece of standard equipment, just like putting on safety glasses or putting on a bump cap if you're working in a weld shop um, so you don't run into anything, or safety shoes. Think of it just as another piece of personal protective equipment. Now, yeah. we, I know you folks, you, you also have, a, you call it a robo glove mm -hmm. that I've seen, and maybe you can give us an update on that. I know you've got a partner you're working with, a, a over in uh, maybe Sweden or somewhere to kind of bring that to production. That kind of helps with the grasping that can also lead to, you know, repetitive motion. Yes, yeah, the Robo Glove is an offshoot of uh, technology that we worked on collaboratively with NASA a number of years back with the Robonaut 2 program. Um, and literally what this is, is it's a glove uh, that you wear that's, w that's wired to a series of mechanical or steel tendons that wire to a battery pack that you wear on your back, like a very small backpack. Mm -hmm. And as you close your hand, it actually pulls on the wires, much like pulling on a brake on a, on a bicycle, um, and a how that activates the brake. As you're closing your hand, it actually is sending a, 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 a signal to the battery pack to actually tighten your, your grip. And there's sensors on the fingertips of the glove. And as you close your hand, it's applying pressure and actually pulling on mechanical tendons that are in the back of the glove. So much like your hand would work, where you close your fist mm -hmm. and the tendons are closing your hands, there's mechanical tendons that are closing that. And it adds three to five pounds of additional grip force. And it's tunable in terms of how much force. It's not quite the Tony Stark Iron Man suit, but mm -hmm. it's a small step along the road. Well, Vanessa's getting using it right now, aren't they? They're using the Robonaut. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, technology, yes. So right now we're, um, we're, in, uh, we're in final production trials with that across the series of plants. Um, and the deployment of that is forecasted for next year. We'll see that across the, um, our plants again. As we deploy this, we deploy these technologies globally to all of our sites. Now, we've been talking about a ton of high-tech things, but I would imagine there are some low-tech ideas that are just very simple, why haven't we thought of that yet kinds of things that you have to be deploying. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole suite of different, different technologies that are associated with this transition to smart manufacturing. Um, so in, this, in, in, the, in the family of analytics, um, the... The low tech, the high tech end of this is the artificial intelligence where the machines are self-diagnosing and fixing themselves. That's a long-term journey. And very frankly, it's not even a position that we view as required for most of our, of, of our environment. It's one more thing to try to keep track of. And as the, as, the, as the technology evolves and changes, this is something that could quickly obsolete. We'd be spending all of our time just maintaining the technology. We're in the business of building cars, mm -hmm. right? Of not, uh, and not inventing and deploying technology. At the other end of that spectrum is just understanding the data we have and being able to make better, smarter, more rapid decisions based upon the data we have. So if I think of this in terms of a technology progression to your question, we are a data-rich company. We measure data on everything that we do. Right? We don't always and haven't always known what to do with all the data that we have. So there's some analytical tools that are being put in place on the plant floor that can now do simple things like trend analysis and looking at sensor data that comes out of our machinery and equipment and looking for out of normal patterns that would just signal electronically, something has changed. Uh, somebody come and take a look at me because something has changed. Now that's not yet the machine being able to fix itself, but that's something that is relatively low tech that we can do right now today, just by layering a little bit of analytics on top of the data modules that we mm -hmm. already have. Um, 
which let us just plug things in across plants without a whole lot of invention and trial and fanfare. Let's talk a little bit about 3D printing as well. I mean, maybe somewhere in the future we'll see high volume manufacturing right. using 3D printing. My understanding though is that you're using 3D printing in your plants to make simple tools. Take it from there, would you? We are, so um, so uh, most of the 3D printing uh, that, you, that people talk about is making parts, making low volume parts. What we've done in addition to that, which we are doing as a company, um, We've installed 3D printers in many of our plants, and this is a migration. Uh, our, our, our plan will be we'll have a 3D printer in every one of our manufacturing sites, and they're able to solve everyday production problems. Whether I need a small tool that can help me address an ergonomics problem that I'm facing, or whether I need an alignment tool to help me with body chassis marriage, um, or whether I need a small prototype part to be able to trial something to help accelerate the understanding of an engineering change on a product that I'm in the middle of launch on. I can make these things on the fly for myself in the plant. And, um, and what we're finding is, is that this is a little bit of a build it and they will come. We installed the technology and the plant from the plant floor ideas are coming forward of things that we would not have thought about ahead of time um, where there are questions, do you have something that can help me do this? Here's a problem that I fight with every day. What can you do to help me with this problem? And rather than have to engage engineers and do a design and then build prototype parts and then do a trial and then figure out how we're gonna source it production and maybe it's weeks, months before you get something to find out, well, that, I didn't get it exactly right. That's not exactly what I wanted. And then go through the loop again. Now in a matter of an hour, I can have a part, I can take it back out to the floor and say, does this meet what you're looking for? Yes, great, no, okay, let's try something else. So in the spirit of work fast, fail fast, iterate quickly towards the correct solution, and then once I've validated the correct solution, then decide how do I productionize that across all my systems. We're using 3D printing as a great tool to accelerate that sort of real-time problem solving in our plants. Volkswagen, uh, it's my understanding, Volkswagen uh, has, has announced uh, working with uh, a supplier, GKN and, and HP, to, uh, to uh, mill 3D parts um, out of metal. Which, which is quite an advancement. And they're looking at- um, To grow 3D parts out of metal and yeah. in a-, in a, in a To ad, print it. Yeah, to print, to print it. it. Yes. An, an iterative process. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and they're speculating within two to three years, they may have this on the plant floor to build, um, to make small components mm -hmm. like, a, like a key set or, mm -hmm. or a bit of personalization for a badge on a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Is that something you guys are thinking about? It's a matter of how fast the, the, the printing technology evolves. We're certainly, we're certainly working on, uh, on metal additive. Uh, it's just one more material in the additive family, and there's a series of different additive technologies uh, that are out there, and we're, we're looking at it and evaluating all of them. Um, but it's really a matter of, of when will the machines be available, what's the cost structure for those machines, when does it become really economically viable to be able to do that? The machines that we have in our plants right now that can do the work that I was describing are less than $30,000. That's not a lot of money. You can, we, can, we can return on that investment very, very quickly. Um, the metal machines may be a little more pricey from a cost standpoint, so we'll need to look at the economics of this, of this also. Um, so, you know, ultimately we'll, we'll be able to 3D print anything, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, you'll be able to one off anything, right? It's, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. It's just today limited by size of the part, chemistry of the powder that you're growing the part from, and the dimensional accuracy and the finishing of the resulting part, right? But all of those things will be, will be resolved, for sure. And on the subject of when, what is on the horizon? I mean, what are the things that we can look forward to in the next decade or so as we see new innovations? What are you looking at as you look forward? 
um, on the 3D printing side? On, on the overall manufacturing footprint period. Uh, how, how it's, you know, we, we've seen so much change in the last couple of decades. What are we going to see in the next decade? I think what, I think what's, um, as our industry evolves from very high volume products to, I will say, lower volume variants, our plants will become a lot more complicated in the future than they are today or certainly yesterday. So the types of technologies will be all about helping the plant work and the workers in the plant operate where every vehicle wants to be fundamentally different than the previous vehicle, which is not really mm -hmm. the mass production system we've all what sort of they, grown they coined up the term, in. mass customization. It's mass customization, which will require uh, different technologies because our people will have to work differently in an environment to be able to build um, vehicles like that. Um, I don't think we, years ago, we had talked about lights out factories and the plants just building vehicles and things themselves. I think we've seen some examples lately um, where maybe that's not quite the right thing to do and we continue to remind ourselves that our people are our most flexible assets. So what can we do to facilitate and help our people sort of thrive and be productive in that much more mass, customized mass production environment of the, fu of the future. And that's clearly where this industry is going. And, and it's already started, in fact. In, in other words, you don't make uh, a million brown four-door sedans anymore. Right. You make all kinds of variants and different sizes and, and body styles, and, and that will continue. Look, we're going to have to uh, wrap this up right now, but... Dan Greishaber, thanks so much for coming on. Very interesting, all this technology coming into manufacturing. Thank you. Great to be with you today. And Jeff Gilbert from WWJ, James Amon from Wards. want to thank the both of you guys, too. Yeah, very interesting discussion here. Underwriting for the production of Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles.